Thank you. It was my first week at William and Mary, the day after convocation, and I was broke. And I did not want to call my father and ask for money. So I needed a job. I looked at waiting tables or shelving books in Swem Library. And then I saw a job posting to fix computers in the, for technical services. And I discovered I loved fixing computers for two main reasons. The first reason I loved it was that they were all puzzles. There was some problem you had to figure out and fix. And the second reason I loved it is it paid three times more than waiting tables. But there was one thing I didn't like about it at all. Mostly, you fix computers in small, windowless rooms, frequently in basements. And so it was that the summer after my freshman year, I was fixing computers in a small, windowless room in a basement in Washington, D.C. And desperate for some fresh air, I would walk around the block and walk around the district at lunchtime. And one day, I walked past the Corcoran Museum of Art, and I decided to go inside. I walked in, and there were these astonishing things hanging from the ceiling. I was completely blown away. They were brilliantly colored and incredibly shaped, and they seemed almost alive, but they were made of glass. In a small grotto off to the side, there was a video about the exhibit, and it talked about how these were called chandeliers, although they resembled no chandelier I had ever seen in my entire life. And they were done by a sculptor named Dale Chihuly, who was overwhelming and changing the glass blowing. He was doing all kinds of incredible things. He himself is a larger than life figure with a shock of hair and a black eye patch like a pirate. So I went back to William & Mary as a sophomore, determined to devote my life to becoming a professional glass blower, and my father was having a heart attack. <laughs> I soon discovered, to my astonishment, there is no glass blowing major at William & Mary. There is not even a glass blowing 101 class. But I heard through the grapevine about this incredible place, the Charles Center, and it kind of seemed like they might give you money to do anything you wanted to do. So I applied, and I received a cross-disciplinary grant. And this summer after my sophomore year, I drove up to Corning, New York, and attended classes at the Corning School of Glass. I learned how to blow glass, and I loved it. Blowing glass is about fire, water, sand, and air. That's it. You could th say it's about the primary and elemental necessities of life. I am not a glass blower today. In fact, I'm not sure I've blown glass since then. So why am I telling you this story? William and Mary gave me the encouragement to follow my curiosity. William and Mary fed my curiosity. And that is one of the best things that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Curiosity is an essential skill in navigating the world we live in. This is a world full of complexity. Everything is complicated. And your curiosity will help you figure things out in small and big ways. That complexity is not an accident. It's really come about in a large part because of some nerds on a quest. What do I mean, nerds on a quest? On college campuses just like this in the 60s, a group of nerds really helped invent the technology that shapes our lives today. The first degree in computer science offered at an American university was at Purdue University in 1962. At the time, computer science was considered almost secretarial. The real sciences were physics and math. But a group of kids who were curious about computers were in there fiddling around. Now, at the time, a computer was an unimaginably large thing. 
A Cray supercomputer of the late 60s, early 70s, cost about $5 million base price, and it would have filled my dorm room in Yates First South. They were, yeah, I knew it. They were giant machines, giant of unimaginable scale. And the only people who could afford these giant, powerful computers were big universities, big governments, and big corporations. So imagine for a moment that you are a nerd on college campuses in the 60s, and you're graduating with a degree in computer science, and your parents think that that's probably dumb and no one gets hired to do that kind of work. And the only place you can get a job is the Pentagon or IBM doing Pentagon contracts. And as you've been on campus in those small windowless rooms, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement have been happening all around you. You don't want to go work for the Pentagon. And so there was a movement among the nerds of the day to do something radical, the most radical thing they could think of, which was to create the personal computer. Imagine if I told you that 40 years from now, when your grandchildren are going to convocation, that you'll be able to walk into a strip mall anywhere in the world, and for 200 bucks and a low monthly fee, you'll be able to buy a Boeing 747. You'd think I was a lunatic. But that's effectively what's happened to computing. Today, we walk around with these devices on our person. We hold them close to our hearts. And they are devices of tremendous power. A smartphone today is so much more powerful than a Cray supercomputer of the 70s, you almost can't compare them apples to apples. It's, it's millions, if not a billion times more powerful than one of those super, supercomputers. And back in the day, these computers were matters of national security. And so we've seen computing power go from available only to the world's largest, most powerful institutions to everybody in this audience having one on their person today. That's a tremendous transfer of power out of big institutions to individuals. And it's disrupted all kinds of things. We see the disruption from Uber to ISIS. And it's in navigating that disruption that curiosity will serve you well. But this is not just about curiosity. I want to take you back for a few moments to the closing days of World War II. Robert Desnos was an incredible French surrealist poet. He was a friend and contemporary of Picasso, Hemingway, John Dos Passos. And when the Nazis occupied France, he joined the French resistance. In the closing months of the war, he was captured by the, French by, by the Gestapo and sent to a concentration camp. And at the very end of the war in this concentration camp, one morning, some German soldiers show up and they load all of the men in the barracks into the back of a truck. And the men know that when you get in a truck like this, you do not come back. And there is silence in the truck as it goes down the bumpy road. And, and suddenly, Robert Desnos, Mr. President, can, can you stand for a minute? Am I going to be OK? You're going to be OK. Robert Desnos takes his hand of the man next to him, and he looks at his palm, and he says, you are going to live a long and incredible life. You are going to be. I like that. Yes. <laughs> You're, you are going to end up the president of one of the great universities of the world. And then, thank you. And then he takes the hand of the man next to him, and he says, ah, oh, you will see and swim in the Pacific Ocean, and you will eat mangoes and coconuts and feast the rest of your life. And he goes to each man in the truck and reads their palm and imagines an incredible future for them. And the mood in the truck goes from silent and grim, men going to their deaths, to men imagining their future, to believing that the world was going to be a better place. In fact, they got so loud and rambunctious that 
the soldier driving the truck pulled over and got freaked out and decided they, they couldn't, they didn't know what was going on. They couldn't, they couldn't kill these men today. And a few days later, the camp was liberated. We're living in a moment of great brokenness. Our politics is broken. Our political process dates back to the days of Colonial Williamsburg. We vote on Tuesday because Sunday is church day and Monday is market day and you ride your horse and buggy into town to vote on Tuesday. As I speak to you, Louisiana is underwater. We have just lived through the hottest month in recorded human history and unfortunately for you, almost every year you have been alive has successively been the hottest year in human recorded history. The manufacturing economy that built the middle class in America has evaporated. Terrorism is a real and present threat. And in the midst of all of this, you must have the courage to hope you must have the courage to imagine a better and brighter day. And you must take the curiosity that this institution will feed and use it to discover the innovative, incredible solutions that will heal this brokenness. And so today, when you walk through the doors behind me, you are going to join a community that goes back to the founding fathers of this nation. And I hope and pray that you do so with great boldness. Thank you.